Okay, <laughs> they're just sorting out. Apparently there's an issue with it going to rumble for some reason. I don't know why, but anyway, here I am on my uh, my little... And I'm getting different sound through here, so i going to change a few things here. Hello, hello, hello. I think I'm up and running. So if you're watching me on Facebook or uh, YouTube, if you can send a message through, but uh, it seems to be working all right on those ones there. But welcome to Tuesday night on What Do You Think? And uh, it's just my little wild live stream idea. Um, <laughs> uh, Tuesday nights I'm trying to make about talking about the music industry, whether it's here in my local southeast Queensland area or, or any parts of Australia, really, or any parts around the world, really. If you're an indie artist or someone who's, you know, really living a life as a musician, um, we'd love to talk about that on these nights. Or if you're an agent or if you uh, run a venue or anything, if you're a marketing person, we just I'd like to use that for the Tuesday nights. I'm also going to stream on Thursday nights, but they'll just be, be, be about more general topics. But tonight I thought I'd um, just try and give a example of how we could run the Muso nights. And to do that, I thought, well, who would I do that with? Someone who's obviously a good friend of mine. And I'm really blessed in the fact that my best friends are, as I know this sounds corny, but my best friends are my four kids. And the eldest of those four kids is Harry. So I guess he's my best, uh, my biggest best friend. So I'm going to bring Harry into the chat. You there, mate? Oh, <laughs> hey, Nick. I didn't see you there. How you doing? I'm good. How's everything at home? Good. Orderly. Everything's uh, ship shape. I'm up in Toowoomba at the moment, visiting my folks up here, and Harry's down in uh, Brizzy, where we live. As orderly as, a, as an artist house ever is, I should say. That's the qualifier. Exactly. Exactly. Which, yeah, that's that's that is a really interesting point. I've got to say. Although <laughs> so. you, I am getting heckled by a cat who has just come to the front door wanting to get fed. So if you hear something in the background, it is the cat. Um, yeah, singing, true. backing vocals. As a family, we, um, we're, we're very much a dog family, I have to say, and, and we lost two of our really good friends last year in our dogs who were very, very elderly. And they, they added a lot to our family, but they passed. But we still have two cats with us. Uh, one is a ginger cat who's like just rules every neighbourhood we move into. He just rules it automatically. And the other one's this little stray grey cat that we kind of adopted along the way who's I don't know. I don't know if she's licking the toads out there or something. There's something going on strange with her, but she's uh yeah, she's an interesting personality, that's for sure. We uh the uh, the orange cat is named Shinobi, which is Japanese for ninja, and he looks closer <laughs> to Garfield the cat than a ninja. So ke uh, keen sense of irony on whoever named that kitten, because we should have probably <laughs> called him Sumo. Um he has no stealth abilities whatsoever. I remember when we first got him and we had Christmas not long after we got him, and he would hide in the Christmas tree, and every time he walked past the Christmas tree, he would come out and attack you like a ninja. Yes, yeah, so he would jump out from under the Christmas tree and scare everybody, and that's where he earned his nickname, but he subsequently discovered a love of all cuisine. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, I don't know how this whole thing works really, but I hope we're streaming live, okay? It says that we are streaming. I uh, know it's to Facebook and YouTube. Uh, it says I can see comments. So if, you, if you're on those platforms or I think YouTube mainly, but if, if you're on there and you can put a comment up and let us know if the sound's okay and everything, that would be great. Now, you'll see there my little show's called What Do You Think? There should be an H in there, but I'll fix it up later. And across the bottom, I just want to do a little plug. I'm, I'm doing a little plug for my 70s Unplugged show down the bottom. And today I booked in a show at the Hotel Metropole at Ipswich on April the 13th. I'm going to do my 70s Unplugged show there. And... Um, um, go to uh, my 70s unplugged show facebook page and you can get tickets through there but um if you're if you're a muso out there and you've got a show coming up or you're doing something special it can be an original show a cover show i don't care it's all music it's all playing music and communicating with people let me know message me if you'd like to come on to my little live stream and talk about it because um that's what this thing's for i i just want to get a bit of a community happening where all of us can just chat and chill argue sometimes or have debates but in a very friendly way and I don't see how argue we can make about things. Harry shut up. <laughs> Sorry. 
<laughs> but but we need to be able to just um, yeah you know, see how we can make our industry our local industry better. Uh, it's been a really tough <laughs> couple of years, but mate, particularly for you, like I've I've obviously been a full time mus- musician now for over forty years, and um, I've seen the ups and downs as it's gone through the whole thing. But you know, you're you're on the very much you're on the you were on the emerging part of the thing before the whole COVID thing hit. You uh, won the Billy Thorpe Awards with Q Music, as uh, which is pretty much like the up and coming guy in the state for that year of songwriting. Um, and COVID, you know, put a, 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 a tack in the tire and slowed down your progression in that in that space. But as the emerging artist these days, what's the, what's the industry like out there at the moment for you? Well, the industry I would say is um, completely and utterly transformed from where it was prior to sort of online streaming and social media. Everything is based around that now. So probably the biggest change and challenge for musicians now is that when you used to go out to gigs, you would probably have CDs with you and you could sell CDs and you might sell CDs for $5 or $10 and it would help you sort of repay back the cost of the recording that you'd done and the more live shows that you did, the more people you could sell CDs to so you could make back money from it. Now you are a business owner as you always have been, but now the product is free because people can just get it from streaming services. So musicians have to be very inventive in how they actually earn their money these days. And um, the flip side of that is that you have an ability to cultivate an audience by going online. But what that means is that you basically have to become a director, content planner, online personality, producer, sound engineer, um, everything all in one so that you can consistently produce content. So it's an opportunity in that way because you're not uh, beholden strictly to record labels and waiting for someone to come and tap you on the head and say, and now it's your turn. But there is a um, a lot more that you have to do on the ground level because at the same time, labels aren't really looking for anybody who's getting started who has talent. They're looking for people who are already established and have a following because uh, labels are, are smaller these days. So they basically want to take something that's already a good thing and try and help you make it even bigger. So it's probably completely flipped on its head 180 degrees from um, before all that. So... Mate, when I was in my early 20s and I I became a full-time musician, we had a few ways to make income. One was through live performing. Um, We actually got quite a fair bit back from the royalties of um, from APRA when you play your own original songs at your gigs. Uh, You you get paid for that, and and yeah, back in those days, when you're working five or six nights a week, and you you if you're playing. 10 or 15 of your own songs during a night. Well, across the year, you'd probably get five grand back at the end of the year from APRA for playing your own songs. You could then add in merchandise, but but also CD sales. They were a big part. You know, if you could press a CD and sell 2,000 CDs at, at $15 a head, you know, you had sort of 30 grand to top up your, your, your income through the year. Through streaming, it seems that, well, the APRA royalties have definitely diminished. I actually got a message from APRA for my stream, my streaming um, the other day for, a, I think it was, a, a, I think it was half the year. I'm not sure, but it was like $3.60 or something like yeah. that. CD sales went out the window. The live gig money has gone down. Um, is it is it possible from your perspective now for an independent artist who's moving their way up to just make their income out of music like I was used to be able to do? Uh, I think that it's possible, but I would say that if you're trying to do it strictly through original music, it takes a lot of um, a lot of creativity and a lot of time to really build an audience online. I don't know how anybody would do it without an online audience because there's also not a live music scene to the extent that there was back in the day Um, and definitely not the same number of people going to local gigs that there were back Mm. in the day. Like you could probably pretty reliably count on, say, the Norman B on any given weekend to be absolutely chock-a-blocked full listening to bands and artists and stuff on a weekend back in the day. Well, well, well you did, you did like what you did, you did when Tuffy built it up. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But some of the venues um, he but, walked, some of the venues he worked in uh, and people, one of the things was interesting, most musicians I know both do cover gigs and play originals until they get to a point where they can just live off their original music. 
But Tuffy often talks about how much, you know, crap he capped, he copped from just, you know, doing his cover th- his cover shows. But he took a lot of those venues that he worked in from 10 grand turnovers a night to 115 grand turnovers a night. Yeah, you know, he really yeah. made a difference. And, and when they did that, that meant that they could actually employ musicians five nights a week because they were making so much money off those big nights. Yeah. Um, and I, I think one thing that's missing these days, and there seems to be a bigger delineation between artists who say they're original artists and artists who are cover artists. And I think that for me personally, I don't, I don't need your opinion on this at all, but I think Arts Queensland, Q Music and all that have had a role to play in this, that, they, that they've split the difference. But so many of the good artists I know have done both. Even the Beatles, Led Zeppelin, Powderfinger, they did cover shows as, all, as well as also developing into original acts. So I think it's um, one of the one of the th- sad things that's missing these days is that ability to make your income out of playing music in any form and having to do other work to sup- to enable you to do the music which limits the time you can do on your music. The blessing for me was growing up, it might say growing up in my early 20s, it was 24, seven days a week, 24 hours, seven days a week um, playing music. And that even that even passed over to the guys who were running the, the road crew, the guys doing the, the sound and lighting. They learnt their skills by being on the road seven days a week. And I think that's a big thing that's missing now is so many artists don't get to live their music job every day of the, every day of the week. Yeah, I would definitely say that um, there was a lot more bands playing every night of the week back in the day, which means that those bands were tighter together. Like, I mean, when you play every day with the same <laughs> bands, um, it's just chalk and cheese to a band that plays together once a week or once a fortnight. Um, which is maybe more what happens these days. And I would say that if you're going to be a band that's doing original music these days, um, you know, it's basically more or less um, not something that you could make a living off unless you're bringing in a lot of people at the door. So it's um, a a long road to actually build things up because a lot of those places aren't necessarily full um, of their own accord. Uh, But it's just, I mean, it's just different. Um, I would say that, with the social media stuff, that's really the the track that everyone has to go down now, which is um, good on the one hand, because you can create an audience anywhere in the world. Um, but it make it's a very different type of experience. There's a lot of setting up to film and edit and plan and a lot of talking to a camera, which is a very different experience to showing up every night and playing at a party, essentially, which is what live music is. Um, So it's probably attracting people with a little bit different tastes to the whole thing as well. Um, And then, as you say, I think that if you are going to do the make a choice between covers or originals, especially depending on what gig you're doing, you really have to make a choice to to either be a covers artist or an originals artist. There's not a lot of blending that goes on. It's that, it's that def, there's that, is that definition these days. Because back in when, when I was out in the circuit, you know, so many of the bands on the circuits also did their original stuff as well. It was a, the way they paid to do, to do their original stuff was through their cover stuff. And, um, yeah. And, and yeah, uh, yeah, uh, we, Tuffy and I keep coming back to the, you know, the, the Keith Urban story, but, you know, Keith cut his teeth and paid his way and working with Rusty and playing covers with Tuffy and all that stuff and got to where he was. I say the same with the Powderfinger Boys. They used to play at Her Majesty's Bar where I played there, and and um, you know there's that real crossover vibe that you, you you fed yourself through the covers while you built your originals until you could get to the point where that was um, you could make a living out of originals. But mate, the main thing I wanted to talk to you about, if you don't mind tonight. And by the way, thanks to Jan Taylor who saw my '70s show at Redcliffe. I need to plug that because I'm really proud of my '70s show. I I seven the '70s were all school years for me, primary and high school. And that's the most influential, you know, part of your life. And um, um, in this show, I bring back a lot of great memories and everything. So I'm, I'm just really cool to promote my show. So thanks, Jan, for your little plug there. And I'll turn that Ben off down there below in a sec and um, uh, just get back to Harry and I. But, mate, I want to get talking about songwriting. Now, you went through, you, you were a good songwriter. Back in school, you were a great storyteller. You, you were always telling stories and you were amazing always telling teachers. White lies. Yeah, and that as well, and that as well. Well, not really liking school, 
you would obviously <laughs> um, amuse a lot of your teachers with the stories you would tell. And, um, yeah, you were a really good soccer player, like you and your brother. You, you went through injury stuff, and um, that while you were going through injury, you kind of got drawn into the mu music thing because apparently you have a, a couple of weird parents who do that type of industry. Yeah, and, oddballs, and, oddballs. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, it's like take the safe road, son. Take the safe road, son. That is really hard to say when you know you've never done that your whole life. But anyway, songwriting, mate. You've won some awards with song songwriting. You've got to go to camps in Holland, I think, in Japan. Ah, um, uh, so I went Sydney. to the Netherlands and I went to Sydney for songwriting. Sydney, so okay, mate. I just like you to talk a little bit about your process of songwriting. What songwriting is to you how do you um um yeah what mindset do you need to get into to to um do it oh, and i'll talk a bit about mine after a while but um, you know we're here to talk about you know this thing isn't about me talking about me it's about talking about my guests you're my guest so i'd love to hear about your view on songwriting yeah no if you if you if you wouldn't mind just um i know that you're a bit of a beginner to all this music stuff so if you sit back and listen Absolutely. to someone like me <laughs> apparently tell you about songwriting that makes sense. Right. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm up for an education. Trust me, it's good. <laughs> um, well, for me, I think the first thing I've got to say right off the bat is that songwriting for me is the most important part of music. So I don't mind. I like performing music, but the thing that really um, gets me excited is when I get to write music and then perform my original music because to me there's so much more self-expression in that, especially if I'm doing lots of gigs. Um, and, uh, I would also say that I, in, in my experience, uh, you know, doing a music degree and took writing with lots of people around different countries and around Brisbane and stuff is I have observed almost no correlation whatsoever between how good someone is at playing their instrument and how good they are at songwriting. They're essentially almost two completely different things. Um, and I'm yeah. not saying that there aren't great people, people who aren't great at their instruments who aren't also great at songwriting. Those people are absolutely out there. But just I have met lots of people who are virtuoso musicians who actually, it's when they write songs, it's like they are writing their first song. And it's because they haven't spent a ton of time writing song or that they yeah. approach music from a very academic or um, theoretical Theoretic. standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. And to me, um, that's never been what actual songwriting is about. To me, songwriting is very much about finding something authentic. And off, very often, it's an, it's an energy, actually, that um, I dial into, I would say, and that I'm searching for. Drop my guitar pick. Um, and that's how uh, actually a lot of the songwriters that I admire have spoken about it, too. I heard Jim Morrison talk about songwriting and he said it's like you're just sort of interpreting something that's coming through the universe and it's like it's already been written and you're putting it down i've heard paul mccartney talk about songwriting the same way um i've heard john lennon talk about it that way i've heard um uh, uh who did heart of gold neil young i heard neil yeah. young talk about it that way um and uh especially people like john lennon and bob dylan if you look at them from a music virtuosity viewpoint, like I love both voices and I think both, you know, are, they're in my all time idols, which is why I bring them up. But Bob Dylan and John Lennon are not actually fantastic at playing the instruments or singing per se. If you look at them from a technique point of view. Understand, yeah. yes. <laughs> and jo John Lennon was actually always very self-conscious about his voice. Um, mm -hmm. but the reason why they are extraordinary as artists is because they're able to tap into some sort of energy and feeling, some sort of universal emotion. So when I start writing songs, that's really what I always look for. And um, the other things on top, like some people will say, do you write lyrics first or do you write chords first or do you come up with a melody first? Do you start with an idea in mind or do you work it out and... I would say to anybody who's actually curious and writing their own songs so that there's no wrong way to do it. And that if somebody tells you there's a definite rule about songwriting that I encourage you to break that rule because you're probably going to find original ideas on the other side of that rule. Absolutely. But, Mate, there, 
there are so many little and sorry to interrupt you there, but there no. I'm amazed I'm amazed at little lines that pop up. And I, I've written a lot in my songs where I'll write the line, I will write the song, and I'll listen hear my song decades even later, and I say I have no idea where that line came from. Yeah. And an example that something that strikes me, I haven't spoken to Bernard about this, but I'd love to love ask Bernard Fanning about uh, the Powder Finger song um, where they go, um, 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 uh, he, walking down the street now, he'll push through the rusty gate, the click of your heel on the concrete. That, that little phrase, click of your heel on the con- concrete, is a magical phrase to me. It's just like it's so obvious a thing that we hear in our life but it's subconsciously we hear it that why would you write it in a song and you wrote in one of your songs emma you got um there's a line you put in her lies and her show tunes which yeah. takes a little bit to hear what you're actually saying in that part of the song seems to me to be one of those other ones did you consciously write that line or do you sit back now and say where the hell did that line come from i'm not sure um, I think with that particular line, I had a sort of something that I was trying to evoke rather than something specific that I was alluding to. But I think that when I, when I sort of was thinking about that, it's like some p- people being very elaborate with the performances that they put on to kind of be a bit facetious, you know, um, mm. lies and show tunes, you know, um, I think that's kind of what I was um But But did you about, find that line... Did you find that line or did that line find you? I think that a lot of lines tend to find me. There's another one yeah. in a song that I had called Love Drunk, which is, it's just a little phrase that some are coined from somewhere. And it's basically just talking about somebody who is hooked on someone who they shouldn't be <laughs> attracted to. Yeah, It's a very bad idea. But just something about the phrase, you're love drunk. Like I haven't, okay. it's probably can, out Can you play a bit of that? And Can you play a bit of that for us and put in perspective? Sure. Um, I'll just play a, a quick verse in chorus so you hear it in yeah. context. Cool. People don't hold weight. They come and go like clouds, only drift around. They go where the wind blows. Think of me the same. I'll never settle down. It's too much. Don't ask for love, we go without. You love drunk, it's not me. You'll dust off, I can't leave you alone. You're just too much fun, yeah. I can only say I'm sorry. Like that, and some, uh, but and. Sometimes you just find a phrase that you've never actually heard before, but that sums up exactly <laughs> what sentiment you're trying to put across. And that's a big part of writing lyrics, I would say, is finding something that evokes the mood or the vibe that you're trying to put across um, rather than finding something that, you know, literally makes sense that people would immediately understand. Because in the, in the context of the song it's going to make sense. And other people can draw different meanings out of it too, which is a really cool thing about songwriting. Now, I have a little bit of a inside knowledge, but um, you've won some awards where you got to travel and go to songwriting clinics and camps. Mate, I am the world's worst co-writer. I, my, my pleasure place for writing songs is just being by myself, getting locked in my own little head zone and letting the song and the words find me. When you're thrust into an environment where you in, whether it's in Denmark or, or Holland or I mean, Holland, sorry, yeah, wherever you were, or Sydney, and and you're, you're put in these situations where you have to co-write. What was that experience like, like for you? Was it easy or was it challenging? No, or is, no, is there a skill to that? First of all, yes, there's a skill. Songwriting, absolutely, in every sense, is a learnable skill. So one thing that I was firstly just alluding to before is that this idea that I think the first thing whenever you're going to write or create anything is to tap into some sort of energy that connects with you. And then the skill, the learnable skill of songwriting, I would say, is being able to take that rough clay of whatever you've tapped into 
and then use whatever techniques that you want to actually mold it into some sort of masterpiece. And most of the time when you're starting out, you're going to come up with something that looks like garbage because that's what happens when you first try and mold clay or write songs. And so co-writing is another technique that you can use. So I sucked at co-writing. I still would not call myself a fantastic co-writer, but I'm much, much better than where I was. And the way that I used to co-write, I would tell you the exact wrong way to do it, which is what I did forever, which is, uh, so you sit in a room with somebody else and there is a blank sheet of paper staring back at both of you. And (laughs) songwriting is quite an intimate thing. I think most people would understand is that you're putting out private emotions and, you know, uh, so it's, it's tricky enough to put it into a song and share with people at the best of times, let alone someone who is very often a stranger who you've just met who's sitting in a room with you. So it's a, it's a, um, a process that requires a lot of trust between people very quickly. And or it's what easy to slip in the cliche mode. Oh, yeah, for sure. And, or, well, what I used to do, which is even worse, is that I would sit there very quietly in the corner and then try and come up with a really well-formed idea that I could put out there, sing clearly, I knew what the lyrics meant, I was happy with how it went, and I thought, this idea represents me properly. And so I would put it out there because I was worried the other person was going to shoot it down or not know where I was coming from with it. And so the end result was that we would often sit there in silence next to each other but not communicating for half an hour or more, writing completely separate songs, And if we did come up with something good and share it with the other person, it was completely different to whatever train of thought they were on. So that's the wrong way to co-write. The right way to start any songwriting, and especially a co-write, but this is for solo songs too, is you first have to remove your ego. So there's this great quote from a famous Nashville songwriter where he said, um, you know, he had like ranches that he had bought with his songwriting royalties. He was like a legend in that, in Nashville. And um, he said to someone who was coming to co-write with, with him one day, he said, in this next writing session, I'm going to say some of the stupidest things that you've ever heard somebody say. And you're yeah. going to say some of the stupidest things that I've ever heard you say. But as long as that door over there is shut, the secret's safe between us. And so that's what you have to do with co-writing is you, as soon as you get an idea that you think could be even half decent, even if you don't even really like it, but you just think it might be something, put it out there, say it out loud. And then the other person, if they don't really like it, the way that they do it in places like Nashville and what I got taught is if you don't really like it, just don't say anything and just ponder it in your head or come up with new ideas. And if you stay quiet, it's an invitation to the other person to elaborate on that idea or throw out the next idea And then you can throw out an idea and you just keep throwing out ideas and you don't have to reject anything, but just keep throwing out ideas. And then as soon as somebody comes up with something cool, the other person goes, oh, I like that. And then so you've got something and then you keep throwing it out there and then eventually somebody else throws out an idea and you go, oh, I like that. And so you kind of are just throwing ideas at the wall until you find things that you like. And the other really important ingredient about co-writing that I found is that don't preconceive what the song's going to be let the song find you so don't go in trying to write a particular song or if you get a first good idea that you think's leading to a certain place don't try and force the song down that way try and actually make it a collaboration and that's the the um the benefit of co-writing is that you get something that neither person would have thought up on their own the trade-off of that is you have to be vulnerable with somebody else and you have to accept that it's going to be something that you wouldn't come up with on your own. So that's a double-sided coin. And Mm -hmm. I would say the art of being able to be vulnerable like that and the art of being able to let go of prior expectations is really the magic of co-writing. And then do a lot of them. Because, you know, if you write 10 songs with different people, a few of them are going to be duds, some of them are going to be okay, and some of them are going to be good. Um, and so that's how I approach co-writing these days. And I found it to be such a much better process, but you know, that's not always easy. Like when I went to the Netherlands and to Sydney, I was writing with people who had like been nominated for Grammys and won Arias and like, like big people. And we were going to pitch to big record labels like Sony and BMG Talper and like, and like big, uh, people and big labels and it's very, uh, it's a nerve wracking process to like throw Mm -hmm. out an idea 
and mm. have these big people be like, oh, I don't know about that one. And they're like, it's it's hard enough to throw out the first idea, but if you throw it out three or four and they didn't like any of them, the fifth idea is pretty hard to throw out. So, yeah. you know, but you just got to be brave. And that's um, what it's all about with co-writing. Mm. The, the dichotomy for me is I'm up front. I've never been good at co-writing. Um, I'm, I'm not good at rehearsal. You know, I'm, I'm like, I, if we have to rehearse a show with a band or something, I'm like, I kind of expect everyone to know what they can do pretty much immediately and let's just get yeah. it over and done with. Songwriting, I've, I've been split into two personalities. One, I've got the side of me, which has been my artist, which the songs I've put on my albums. And I really don't know where those songs come from. I sit down with my guitar, everything's written on my guitar. And I would just start somewhere, normally have nothing to say. I just know I need to come up with, say, 12 songs for this next album. And I just explore where they take me and they take me somewhere. At the same time, I've been able to develop a process where I'm really good at project writing. So I'm whether someone wants a song is written for them as a gift or it's for a company or it's state of origin or I've written songs for the Australian Defence Force or even the songs I had chart in China. I sat down and I had an outcome I needed to deliver out of that song. And I was able to do that. If I take that into the songs out of my album, I really struggle to actually say, I want to write a song about this particular part of Australian character. I, I struggle. I can't do it. But if yeah. someone comes with me to a brief, I can do it. Yeah. So I've had people say to me, oh, you should teach songwriting stuff and you should do this and but my problem is I know how to do what I do, but I don't understand what I do. Does yeah, that make sense? Yeah, well, yeah, well, what that reminds me a lot of kind of what I was referring to before is that, like, the first thing I look for when I go to write a song that's really meaningful to me is I'm looking for some sort of energy to tap into. And I guess what I mean by that is some kind of inspiration. And very often for me, melody, like the main melody of the song and the lyrics will come at the same time. Um mm -hmm like the, the first little bit, the little phrase or something that I build the song around will come at the same time. And, um, but what it, it sounds like what you're talking about there is actually like the mechanics and the, the craft of songwriting versus the inspiration of an artist, which is like what I find a lot is that especially people who are session songwriters go into a session with an objective in mind and they can write a chorus that gets big like this and they can use this chord progression and they can make it rhythmic like this or they can make the song about this. But those mechanics of songwriting, like writing to a brief, is different to when you get that sort of inspiration fall out of nowhere and um, it kind of hits you like a bolt of lightning and... I find that when a song kind of falls out of somewhere and you interpret it and you're inspired, those songs tend to end up meaning more to me. But I still like to develop the songwriting skills because when the inspiration strikes, you have the skills there to sort of help navigate it and shape it into what you want it to be. That's how I've found it. But I exactly. have found that if I sit down to write a song, I can write a song and sometimes they're pretty good songs just with the toolkit that I've learned over so many years, but it will sometimes be missing that magic inspiration that is there on some days and not there other days. Yeah, mate, mate, you're pretty good. I mean, I have to say that um, <laughs> I now, you know, I, I'm a 41 plus year professional musician and singer songwriter. And I think you know, if I need to write a song now, I can pretty much most times sit down and write what I want and come out with the, with the end result. Yeah. Earlier in my career, I would probably had to have like a 50-50 hit rate, you know, half yeah. the songs I discard, half half did okay. You, at your early stage in your career, write a lot of really good songs that you keep. And I think you're well ahead of the curve in me as far as your, your, um, your rate of um, um, being able to deliver what you want to deliver in a song. And, and I think, I think the, the thing you went through with JMC, the stuff you've done with the co-writing, I think your focus on production, are all things which have added to that, those, that strengths. Um, whereas me, I was always much a live performer writing songs and I didn't have that other set of um, skills in my, in my kit bag, if that makes sense, you know, yeah. as I went well, through it. 
well, my experience of learning about extra things about songwriting is like different ways to get to the same result, right? Like when I first started songwriting, people will probably find this amusing. When I first started songwriting, my ear, my musician ear wasn't attuned enough to actually be able to f- work out what chords went under my melodies. And Absolutely. so the what I had was I had melodies that I would like go and write just with no instrument, uh, melodies and lyrics. And I would write them down onto an iPad, like in the notes section, but I couldn't actually work out what the music was that went underneath them. So I had tons of songs there that I could sing a cappella to people, but I couldn't actually work out what the music was to them. And but let me let, actually... let me share with let me share with you a a, um, a magical night for me in the sense your 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 sister Laylee, when she was about four, she fell off a. Uh, a swing set and I was on rollerblades and I didn't catch her on time and she broke a leg. And anyway, one night shortly after that, I was driving back from a gig at the Gold Coast where we, we lived at um, um, in North Brisbane at that time. And on the way back, this song came to me in my head. It was Sweet Thing was the name of the song. And it came to me. It was the only song that ever came to me fully formed. The lyrics I could hear the guitar riffs. I could hear everything. And I got home and I think I I didn't sleep that night. I just stayed up working out what was in my head. I had no idea what I was playing. It was like listening to someone playing a song on a a CD and trying to work it out. I could hear that in my head. It's the only time it's happened to me. And then we went into the studio and recorded it. (laughs) And this is not a new thing for me. Yeah, I, I these days I can't read music. You know, coming out of high school, I, mean, I've pro- I don't know if I've told you this, but in my senior year at high school, I was the statewide Queensland statewide bass champion in the public school sector. I won that I didn't award. Know that actually, yeah, it was true. I won that award and um, the best bass player in the in the in the public school sector. And I could read music back then because we were doing it at school. Since then, you never read music anymore. You know, you go in the studio, you learn how to play guitar, you do you know, all this stuff you did and was always jamming with the band and you work with a great guitarist and a bass player and they knew their stuff and you, and you just learned the, the skill of reading music. But when I would take a song like Sweet, Sing, Sweet Thing into the studio, I'd generally be recording with like Jason Milhouse or Mick Flanders, who I've recorded most of my stuff with, and I'd have to sit down with Mick and say, mate, here's a song, I'll play it to him. Said, so, mate, here's like a chord chart for 70% of the song. But I have no idea what these chords are called because I, I didn't worry about what they were called or the, 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 um, the theory behind them. I would just figure out what needed to sound right and what was sounding right in my head, and that happened with Sweet Thing. And Mick would then work out the chords so we could chart it out for everything else. But that was the one time, that song Sweet Thing, where everything was laid out in my head and I worked it out. And I got it right, but then I needed other people to interpret to me what I got right. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's it was a bizarre of, experience. Yeah, well, I think that's super cool. That has happened to me before as well, but very, it's very rare. It's very, it's a really yeah, cool very feeling rare. when yeah. like a song just comes out of nowhere, and you're like, "Wow, yeah. that's awesome!" Um, it's like the universe but, gives you the song, you know. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. Um, it, which is, it feels like you're interpreting something. You're so right. Mm. Um, but that's what I was talking about. Is that there's no co- in- inherent correlation between people who can actually interpret something and can find the song, and people who have the music education to actually chart it or whatever. Like, yeah. I think yeah. not enough people actually understand those are completely different skills i know sense, people yeah. who have who have doctorates in music who can't write a song you know so I, they actually, but i, they I know some great that. classical players who who are brilliant absolutely brilliant at playing the music in front of them but if you get them into a jam session where they have to think freestyle they haven't got those skills yet yeah. you'll get someone who's never had a guitar lesson in his life but has learnt his his playing by street a street level is is a master so there's yeah. no one direction. But the thing is, in this whole mesh of the music world, we all have our roles to play and they all fit together perfectly at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, like you're saying, like I, people, there are people who, like, I sort of, I think, had a bit of an intuitive 
um, sense of what would maybe work together in a song. And every now and then I come across people like that who are just getting started in music, but I go, I listen to their songs and I go, you don't really know what you're doing there, but what, it really works. Like you, do, yeah, you yeah. don't know that chord change and that melody yeah. choice you made, but good choices. Like, so well, yeah, it's interesting. I've had close friends of mine who've, who they write a song and me in my, in my, um, you know, I would say my my wrong approach, I would say that doesn't sound right. But then you get used to what they're playing and how the song works and you go, they were so right, that's different. It didn't work in my head because my head was locked into this thinking. But yeah. if I move out of that space and get used to it, it works brilliantly. Yeah. And one of the biggest things I would say about songwriting is probably authenticity rather than yeah. originality or and definitely authenticity over following some sort of prescribed rules. Like if somebody can play something and deliver it with the uh, emotional energy that the actual song requires, then you people's ears will get used to just about anything. And that's where people break new musical ground for me is that they come up with something original and then just the authenticity. Well, no, don't say original. Your, don't say original. Your original point <laughs> was awesome. You said go for authenticity, not originality. Yeah. And I, I was just thinking for the, it confused me for the moment. But that really makes sense. Authenticity. You can have a song that sounds a bit like something else, but if if it's in the context of your song, it's authentic. That is that rises above anything that's originally never been heard before. Yeah, there is a... like, yeah, sorry. Well, I was just going to say, for instance, there are so many players I know who know so many elaborate chords and they'll put together yeah. melodies and chords that have never been heard in combination before. But what people tend to gravitate towards is like four chord pop songs using the same chords. But yeah, those songs can still, can still pack such a punch though, because yeah. even though you've heard the chord progression before and it's not necessarily original and the song might be a love song. Every song is a love song pretty much. But mm -hmm. if somebody finds... Or a depression song, love song or depression song. Yeah, one or the other. <laughs> but if somebody finds an authentic way to say it, it can still really hit you because ultimately songwriting isn't necessarily... A, there's nothing new under the sun anyway, especially in music. Yeah. So if you, if you can find that authentic voice, that's what resonates with people because songwriting is more about touching on the... Uh, cornerstone experiences in someone's life and in their consciousness uh, than it is about um, coming up with a novel idea, you know? Mate, as one, of, one of my four anyway. best, as one of my four best friends, I've loved having this chat about this stuff about music writing here. Um, but can, let's diverge, a li let's just diverge a little bit and talk about where are you at? What's, where are you at now with your music or your life or, you know, what the, yeah, is there a pathway forward for you in that space or what are you attaining to do? I think that uh, there is a path forward for me in the music space, but it's just one of those things where you have to juggle life and like earning a living with music. So I don't particularly enjoy doing cover gigs all the time. I just find them a mm -hmm. bit too repetitive and they um, just because of the way that I um, sang for a long time, they're quite hard on my voice too. Um, I still love writing and putting out music and stuff, but um, I'm sort of building up an online profile and building up other skills outside of music that um, I'm hoping will be complementary and allow me to focus on the more passion project side of music rather than uh, I found that doing the cover stuff all the time was quite draining. Um, and wasn't enabling me to earn, earn as much as I would want either. So I kept feeling like I was going in circles a bit. And I also feel like the um, the songwriter part of music that really spoke to me actually isn't fulfilled at all from doing cover songs because I'm not uh, expressing what I've got going on. Um, but there is a lot going on in the world at the moment that I feel very strongly about and that I can take that same sort of creative energy and the angst and whatever else you want to call it that I can put into songwriting, but I can channel it into other things too. Like I'm studying a diploma of justice, for example. And mm -hmm. so justice has a lot of important philosophical questions or questions about what's right and what's wrong. Um, and what's going to, how's the world going to change? And I think there's a lot of really foundational questions being asked at the moment, especially around topics like AI, for example, 
um, that I would like to be involved in um, and not watching it all unfold and feeling a bit helpless about it. So that's, um, I'm also directing a lot of energy into that kind of space as well, trying to build up um, different skill sets. Am I shocked that you're studying justice? This is a guy, as a younger guy, was like working for free at the dog rescue pounds um, for the justice for their dogs. It doesn't surprise me at all. Mate, we had some pretty interesting um, news mess news releases come out today. Um, mm -hmm. uh, we're both aware and <laughs> well, I'm not going to get too far into the politics of it all, but over the last few years we had um, a, a flu thing that went on that kind of very much disrupted a lot of um, lives around the place and people got forced to do things they really didn't want to do. But today the Supreme Court in Queensland um, um, yeah, really made a uh, commitment and uh, made an announcement that mandates for the um, police service and some of the um, frontline people were illegal. Is what I believe they make you're doing yeah, justice. Unlaw is that, unlawful. Uh, unlawful. Yeah. So does that open up the door then for you know teachers and even people in the gig economy to get together and and make claims against the people who screwed up their lives during this whole thing? Well, there was also another case in South Australia recently where a court um, said that an employee of a company, of a private company who got laid off from their job for refusing to comply with a mandate um, could actually sue that company. Mm. So um, I think that probably government would like to pivot a lot of that responsibility onto private industry and the actual um, medication companies that rolled out a lot of that technology, they can't be sued. That was part of their agreement. So yeah. um, government would probably not want to wear the responsibility of that financially. So it's going to be an interesting time, but mm. that's an, a, a very um, interesting and important ruling. The Australian Senate also passed a resolution. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just following on from that before you get to that, I'd just like to say that um, while the government's trying to flick this on to companies, it was interesting that um, Senator Babbitt today announced that um, in the Senate, 31 to 30 the vote went. So there was... All the Labor Party were 30, <laughs> the Independents and the Opposition Party were 31, but they passed a vote that allowed investigation into the excessive deaths that have happened over the last few years just to say, let's investigate it from, you know, 20, 21, 22, 23. There's been pe more people, people dying in Australia and around the world, but in Australia than ever before. And... Instead of sitting back and just saying, ha oh, so what, which is obviously what the opposition, the, the Labor, Labor Party wants us to do, the Senate has passed a thing that says we should investigate it. And I think that combined with the Supreme Court scenario is actually a pretty big step forward for people who just want to question what's gone on for the last few years. We're not, we're, we're not wearing tinfoil hats and chasing after conspiracy things. So many people in our industry have been negatively affected by what's going on. We just want things to be investigated. So next time an emergency happens or a so-called emergency happens, it's managed better. Am I okay in saying that? Uh, well, you're okay by me saying it. Uh, there yeah, are, totally. I, don't, I don't know if Meta <laughs> thinks you're okay in saying it. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, I would say that increasingly people are falling into two camps. There are people who think that a lot of very fishy things went on over the past few years and would like very much for a lot of that to be um, talked about and investigated and looked at objectively so that people can um, almost go through a grieving process and almost go through a... Um, I think people really have to come to terms with what was a very traumatic event and very confusing and a lot of things were moving in different directions all at the same time. And I think that a lot of people really want to sift through all of that and f make sense of it all. And I believe that's yeah. a very important thing. The second group of people, I think, are people who 
don't know in detail the kinds of things that happen, but have a sort of sixth sense that some pretty fishy stuff happened. So I don't think there's actually many people in the third group who are like, oh, I think everything was totally above board and I feel great about how everything went down. I think increasingly it's people who are like, there was definitely, I know a lot of stuff that happened. Another group who are saying, seems like maybe some stuff happened and then not so many people in the third group anymore, which I think is quite telling. And it would probably just help everyone a lot if we went through and did an accounting of all of that rather than memory hole it. Mate, you've also got that group of politicians and like police commissioners who have kind of quit on the back of these things suddenly being announced and everything. So anyway, we'll leave that at that point. Mate, I I really appreciate you coming on because I hope, yeah, over time, I'm, I'm sure there's very few people who are watching us having this chat now, but over time, I'd like to build this if, if I could. And I, on Tuesday nights, I'd love local musicians or musicians from a, across Australia to come on and have a chat and let's just um, tell our stories. And it doesn't matter how many people are watching, let's record our stories. Mate, the things you said have been, I've really enjoyed chatting to you about this. Um, so thank you for doing that, first off. If you you do see this you know, live stream or this, you know, repeated this live stream somewhere and you're a musician who would like to um, jump on and have a chat one night, message me, please. I'm happy to chat to anyone as long as it's civil and done in the right spirit. Um, I'm up for the, for the whole thing. Mate, to wrap this whole thing up, would you mind playing, you know, part of a song or whatever you're comfortable doing, a song or something you'd like to share with people about your music? Um I'm going to think I've got to put your, I should have put this up earlier. I forgot. Hang on. Harry Phillips music. Here we go. So I'm really bad at this stuff. That's where you can follow Harry. Maybe if you could play something and um, mate, um, I'll see you over the weekend. I'll be back home, I think. And um, um, look forward to seeing you. <laughs> and thanks yeah. for doing this little test run about how musos can have a chat. And um, yeah, mate, thank I've you so really, much me on. Well, I love what you're doing. And as I said, you, Beck, um, Laylee, and, and Emily are my best friends in the world. And yeah, you're the, the eldest of them, oldest of them. So you're my oldest best friend. And, um, uh, you know, getting this time to have a chat like this is something we don't do around the table. We don't get the time to. So I've created a podcast and I'll, I'll get to the other three kids along the way and I'll get to have this quality time spending with them sometime. Yeah, it's funny. It's the kind of conversations that we haven't really had, I would say, that much before. So anybody listening well, we, to start a everyone's podcast, busy doing their life. family. Yeah, everyone's busy doing their life. You do the things, the projects you're working on. Yeah, I've got my 70s Unplugged show. I'm, doing, I'm working on the original show. Then we've got to work on the gigs that we're just booking to get through. And, and Anne just got her gig she's working on to pay the bills. And you're doing your thing you're doing and everyone's doing their thing. And um, when, yeah, as silly as it sounds, having a chat like this is very rich because even though hopefully other people see it end of the day it's you and me talking you know yeah and um and that's talking to you mate is a blessing to me so thank you very much well thank you likewise um can i play a short song then i'd love you to play a song all right so this is um on the theme that we're talking about before this is a song that i a lot of it came to me pretty naturally without having to labor over it too much. Um, I have songs that I like that came the other way too, but this is probably the song that I would say most naturally all the jigsaw puzzle pieces fit together for me. And like, I list, I look at it and I think, yeah, that's the song that I set out to write. And it turned out exactly like how I wanted it to turn out. Usually when I write a song, it usually comes out like the, the weird cousin of the song that I was going to write. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this is one that kind of turned out pretty much how I how I wanted it. I could sit watching ships come and go, never know what I missed. I feel a trace, the hidden face of someone who I never knew but can't replace. And searching for you wears me out, I am always tired. I take a break and live for now, but that's not how I'm wired. La da da, da da da. I get carried away, you're only a look away. I could lie to myself, 
spend the days playing games with someone else. And I could talk, make some friends, and use their noise to drown the voice inside my head. But searching for you wears me out, I am always tired. I take a break, live for the now, but that's not how I'm wired. La da da, da da da. I get carried away, you're only a look away. I just can't look away, you're only a look away. Sometimes I sense you next to me when you're not there and it's bittersweet. I'm so caught up on a chance that may never come to pass. If no one else knows how I feel, then the thoughts we have are just as real when they happen in my head. Now I'm laughing at a joke that no one said. I persist, and when I slip, I do my best to assess why I did. I build from mess and learn from stress and write from pain and never say when I'm upset. The searching for you wears me out. I am always tired. I take a break, live for the now, but that's not how I'm wired. La da da, da da da. I get carried away, one little glance is all it takes. You're only, only a look away. Now I just can't look away. You're only, only a look, a look away. away. <laughs> Thanks, mate. <laughs> Love you. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Hey. Talk to you later. Thanks, buddy. Thank you. Thanks for listening, everyone.